Hey everyone, this is Jennifer Beamer, owner operator of Expertly Dyed Art by Science, and this is Fiber Talk episode number two. And today I'm going to talk about Gotland wool. Now, I got for Christmas this awesome book, the Fleece and Fiber Source Book, and it has proved to be a very useful uh, resource. I'm also reading it as if it's a book. I mean, who reads an encyclopedia for fun? I do. <laughs> but what's really great is um, it has over 200 different um, breeds of wool, or sorry, breeds of sheep, and it talks about the wool that comes from those sheep. Plus, it also has a little section about luxury fibers, so things like cashmere and mohair. So I read the entry about Gotland wool. You can see the little cuties on this page and some of the yarn on the other. <laughs> got the cute for the day <laughs> so when I was in Korea lovely lady Ann Britt uh, came to visit her son from Sweden he uh, lives in Korea in Seoul so when she came for her visit she's like you know Jen is there let's you know bring something for her to, <laughs> to work on because as many of you know I felt kind of stranded in Korea because they don't really emphasize wool so much there. They do in Japan and they do in most other places, but not in Korea. <laughs> so <laughs> I think she took pity on me. Plus it was a really great, uh, you know, exchange. So uh, she gave me all this really great Gotland wool that she washed and she did a very good job washing it. So kudos. <laughs> it's, um, it's supposed to be a single coated fleece. And it doesn't immediately strike someone as being really soft. But I think that's just because in this particular fleece, there are more guard hairs or there's, um, you know, some of the fleece is longer and more hairy like than the rest of the locks. So those pieces are a little bit coarse, but the rest of the fleece is actually really, really soft. So. I thought that Gotland was supposed to be a double coated fleece. So I started processing the wool where I would look at the locks and I would take out the little bits of the um, like the long hairy fibers. I would kind of pull them apart from the softer downy fibers and I kept them separate because I figured you know I would use soft stuff for one project and the core stuff for a different project don't ever waste it. <laughs> There's always something that you can make with it no matter how small. Um, plus it doesn't go bad. Anyway, so when I was reading this about Gotland, oh, I was reading this about Gotland, it actually says nothing in these two pages about um, guard hairs or you know a distinct two coat system. Some lovely pictures. These are some of the samples that they had. And you can kind of see there's a lot of uh, variety in the colors. The one that I have is sort of a mixed gray, but there's um, an even more gray version down here. And then there's also like a dark charcoal gray in this one, plus a lightish brown up here. So this fleece comes in a variety of colors. And um, I was also surprised. <laughs> so if you read my blog, I posted recently that um, I had one of those surprise moments where I thought that it was one thing and it turned, about, turned out to be something different. So Gotland is not a dual coated fleece. And what I mean by dual coat or double coated is there are two distinct layers. So there's like an outer coat, which sort of functions to keep water and moisture away from the shorter fibers and these outer hairs are usually more coarse they're more like hair they have a very high mi micron count like 50 or 60 microns which is huge <laughs> um, most merino is around uh what like 18 to 22 usually for for most uh commercial applications of merino so it's really soft but this guard hair really isn't so that is sort of the outer coat and then the inner coat is usually shorter length, it's softer, it's, it's meant to keep the animal warm 
So if an animal lives in a cooler climate, like Gotland, um, it's a very popular uh, sheep in the Scandinavian area, not Iceland, because I think only uh, the specific Icelandic sheep are allowed to be in Iceland. <laughs> But in other parts of like that part of the world in Europe, uh, they will have Gotland sheep. So uh, given the climate, it makes sense that they would have two coats, one to sort of repel the water and keep, keep the water away, and the other to keep the animal really nice and warm. However, <laughs> Gotland isn't a double-coated fleece. Um, and I found that out by reading um, the particular entry on it. But I did want to show you that um, this particular fleece does exhibit um, signs of being a double coated fleece. Now, when I first started processing this, what I did is I took out all of the soft fibers. So anything that I sort of deemed worthy of being worn around my neck. I don't have a lot of sensitivities when it comes to wearing wool around my neck. So, um, for me, this is absolutely fine, but there are still some, I can, I can, can see it now, there are still some of the longer hairs that are coarse in this little batch, but it doesn't bother me. But if someone that you know you're going to make a project for that person be sure to clear out all of the guard hairs, um, if there are any. Uh, but, as I will talk about later when I move on to my discussion with Icelandic wool, um, it also matters how you spin it. If you spin it with a low twist, then the yarn isn't quite so um, scratchy, like those coarser hairs don't stick out of the yarn and poke you in the neck. So, um, it's definitely worth experimenting with and giving it a shot just to make sure. And then let's see if I can find, I found a really great one. Oh, here we go. This feels like steel wool, <laughs> like a Brillo pad. But you can see, it doesn't really have as much of a lock structure as the sample that I showed you earlier. Come on, focus. There we go. So they they kind of, the, the characteristic I would describe this is, is like gray hair. <laughs> so it's, for a lot of people, gray hair is very wiry, and that is exactly how I would describe this. So I can, I can squish this, and it feels like the fiber is pushing back. But when I squeeze this, you know, it's very easy to flatten it. It's very soft. I don't feel hardly any resistance from the fiber itself. But when I squeeze on the other one, I can definitely tell that it's more wiry, that it's like the individual fibers just feel thicker. Like I can actually, on my finger, on my finger pads, I can actually discern uh, the diameter of this hairy fiber. Whereas I can't so much with the um, the softer the softer pieces, so why does this particular Gotland fleece have two coats if the book says it's not supposed to? Well, I know the answer to that, <laughs> and if you read my blog, you probably also know the answer too. Gotland is a very recent acquisition into the fiber world. It was only produced at the turn of the 20th century. And um, for those of us who may be still a little bit on the younger side, that was the 1900s I'm talking about, not the 2000s. <laughs> so in the early 1900s um, in Sweden, I think, it was produced um, to be sort of like a one coat fleece, but its ancestors, the, the line that was the lines that were used to produce Gotland actually all have double coated fleeces. So maybe in this particular animal, it's exhibiting more of these signs of its ancestors rather than of the, the new breed qualities, which is, you know, to make it a uniform fleece. Um, 
I don't know much about the details regarding why this was selected for, but my best guess is it was probably for um, being able to use the wool for something. I think it's actually a meat sheep, but um, if you're going to raise these sheep, you know, you might be able to use the wool for something, but if you have to do all this extra processing, then it may not be worth it and it's not marketable. So, um, you know, they may be looking for a fleece which has an all over consistency rather than one where you have to separate everything and you have two different things to use it for, but maybe uh, the costs involved are a little bit too high or no one wants to put forth the effort, whatever the case may be. Um, this particular fleece does exhibit signs of its ancestors. So there you go. There's my uh, little discussion about um, Gotland fleece. And if you do have the opportunity to use it, definitely um, get some for sampling. Uh, in a different video, um, I think it was one of my daily vlogs, I can't remember which episode it was now, but um, I've been making a lot of videos. <laughs> Um, but I sort of talk about, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens? <laughs> anyway, it probably wasn't too, um, important, but, uh, oh, the, the sample book. So if you want to have sort of a place to gather all your samples that you've been making, or maybe you want to build sort of a personal library of fibers that you've worked with, um, then definitely get your hands on even just maybe 100 grams would be more than enough to really start to get an idea of what Paul Worth could do for you for, for spinning. Um, but the main reason why I'm really excited about my, sorry, did I say Paul Worth? I meant to say Gutland. So the reason why I'm really excited about my Gotland is because um, in New Zealand, there is a breed called Stansboro Gray, and they are a breed of Gotland sheep, which made the famous cloaks from Lord of the Rings. And as many of you know, I am a big Tolkien fan, and um, I'm really excited about having my own handmade, hand-spun, scarf using Gotland wool. So <laughs> I'll post I'll post about my adventures with spinning Gotland in the future when I actually get the moment to uh, work on it. But right now I still have probably a pound and a half or so of this fiber to sort of pick through because I want to make sure that I get as much of the, the hairier fibers out of the softer locks as possible. Um, but again, that's just a personal preference. You can leave them in and spin it with a little bit less twist uh, than you than you might otherwise, just so that um, if there are any of these hairy fibers in the yarn, they won't, you know, stick you in the neck, because <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> anyway, so if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you want me to continue making these Fiber Talk videos, um, also give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. You can also post comments below and give me some suggestions for future uh, Fiber Talk videos. It doesn't have to be wool only. It could be from goats. It could be from rabbits. It could be, um, you know, from your cat or your dog. <laughs> you name it. Um, and I'll see. I'll add it to the queue and see if I can get a hold of the fiber. And if there's something that you specifically want me to talk about on the show, um, let me know, and if you have some that you're willing to donate to me so that I can play with it and, you know, sort of do a Fiber Talk video on that specific fiber, um, let's talk, because, I mean, sometimes you just have dog fiber, and I can't find your dog's fiber on the internet, so... <laughs> um, so yeah, it might, it might uh, work out really well for you, me, and everyone else. So anyway, thanks for watching, and if there's anything else I missed, you can find it in the description below, and check me out on Facebook and Twitter if you haven't already. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye!